Hello everyone this is part 10 of what if Naruto got his wish, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great, it's in the description. The village hidden in the leaves spent 11 more days underneath the shroud of the black clouds. Every now and again, a peal of thunder split the atmosphere, or a brief drizzle would dampen the ground, or a gust would claim a poor villager's hat. These instances were few and far between each other, and caused only a minor nuisance. However, one thing still brought unease to the hearts of the populace, the fact that this ominous gathering of thunderheads had settled over only Kanoa and no place else, its radius ending just two miles or so beyond the village borders. What this portended, none could say for certain. Whispered rumors flew of a device or jutsu to alter weather patterns, brought to bear on them from a foreigner. Others suspected the terrible wrath of an ancient demon just awakened from its slumber, and jumped at loud noises, fearing another Kyuubi had come to the village. Most people, however, chose to shrug it off and go about their business as usual, after all, what had they to fear since their military power had replenished over the past years. Daily life for the village, and for those on the crusade to reform the Hugo clan, was conducted normally, or as close to normally as it could be. Keisuke and Neji, under Shikamaru's direction, he complained of being made a secretary, seeing as he was the one doing all of the mission paperwork and the running back and forth to deliver it, continued to search every marked zone on Kakashi's map thoroughly and repeatedly until there was no inch left unobserved, at which point they would begin again. When they were not searching, they were sleeping, and they ate whatever they could scrounge in their search zones. Such was the importance of the mission. Keisuke was motivated to find something as soon as possible, he wanted to return to other, more personal matters. Haruka had acquiesced to Hanata's plea to be left alone, though she continued to be on watch against the spies of both Hyashi and the council and was able to take advantage of numerous photo opportunities. She managed to keep these to herself, though it tore something within her to not be able to share them. Given the opportunity, she would have shoved the snapshots of the incident at Ichiraku Ramen triumphantly in Keisuke's face and gloated over her success, but Keisuke was never at his house when she came to call, and he never stopped to exchange harassment for very long when they passed on the streets. The Hugo outcast's discontent was prominent more and more often. Naruto and Sakura continued their mission, the former with a wool, the latter not so much. Apparently, Hugo Hanabi was very proud to be what she was and being assigned a bodyguard was clearly considered an insult by her point of view. On top of that, Hanabi often insinuated that she found her own clansmen to be the most effective guardians. Sakura would have liked to point out that if she didn't think she needed protection, then it shouldn't matter to her who was doing the protecting, but the medic was not willing to provoke open complaint. Hanabi's insinuations, delivered politely and coolly, were at least tolerable, but Sakura had never been a great fan of direct complaint from anybody, and once started, Hanabi could crank out more complaints in an hour than Naruto had ever managed in a week, even in his younger days. The pink-haired shinobi was, for once, envious of her blonde teammate, who was having no such trouble at all. Hanata continued to enjoy her time with Naruto, though not a day passed where she did not worry that this time out might be the last. So many things might have gone wrong, one of Haruka's new acquisitions might escape into the wrong hands. Or the advisory council might suddenly change their interpretation of what was, business-like conduct, and make the dreaded decision. Or Keisuke and Neji might find something at any moment and end their mission, freeing Neji to take over the task of her protection. Still, Hanata managed to have a good enough time, laughing at Naruto's antics, blushing profusely at Kiba's more than barely audible remarks to Shino, and reveling in the pride she felt whenever the blonde praised her for the performance in practice or for the exquisite taste of the lunches that she had started bringing him every day. All of them had their successes and their woes, their progress and their setbacks. Shinobi life went on, and the omen of the Thunderheads neither dissipated nor hurled any calamity upon them. Beneath them, however, the shadows stirred, and began to grow restless. Boo. I say to you again, we have no hard evidence. Hyashi still clings to a measure of power, and without photographic proof he will not give way. We can do nothing. The eldest advisor's wheezy voice was taught with exasperation. For days he had been listening to the same old pleas, for days given the same answer. 
First elder, our associates have been observing the girls since the beginning, and that was 11 days ago. Surely, some proof must have been gathered. Just like all the others, this advisor was impatient and caused the first elder much grief. It has not, Hiroshi, sighed the first, knowing that he was going to have to waste yet another 10 minutes reiterating his entire argument. Our civilian agents are incapable of gathering photographic evidence in the presence of the traitor, Haruka. Any camera activity other than her own would be noticed and the film would be immediately confiscated, after which she would be on guard against the agent who was responsible for it. In those rare and happy instances where Haruka is not present, Hanata sama does nothing out of line, and therefore yields nothing of value to us. Then why do we not incapacitate her and do it by force? Haruka is too wily to allow herself to be caught while wandering again. She is a crafty one, once on her guard, she will be difficult to locate, and in the event that she is located, the circumstances by which she is found will alert Hanata sama and allow the prey to escape. There must be something that we may. There is nothing. Not while Uzumaki Naruto remains on this assignment. If we are to have any luck, it will be after his mission ends, not before. For the moment, the side of the false great father has the advantage, and will not lose it until these supposed disciples of Orokimaru hidden beneath the village are found. The advisor called Hiroshi fell silent at last. The first elder exhaled, grateful to the gods for see his argument short. However, he had barely drawn his next breath before he was interrupted yet again. While I agree, rasped the elder across the table, that we can do nothing under present conditions, allowing the false great father to have the upper hand for too long may afford him time to find a weakness in either ourselves or in Hyashi, and tilt the scales of balance even more into his favor. Agreed, voiced a middle-aged female Hugo, we cannot stand by and let this go on. If we are unable to find hard proof while the snake Senon's forces lurk in the shadows, then let us have those shadows lifted. Are you suggesting that we attempt to find them ourselves, Hinako? Asked the first elder warily. Surely you are not volunteering our forces to go off on a wild goose chase to find nothing, or to be brutally s if they by chance to find them. Of course not, Hinako huffed, tossing her fraying auburn hair. I am suggesting that we plant evidence in the secret places of the village and arrange for them to find it. Now you are arguing for having our own people arrested and interrogated. No. I mean to have them find evidence that the sound shinobi have been here but abandoned their mission. In all honesty, I believe that's why they haven't attacked yet, Orokimaru noticed that Akatsuki has been more active lately and withdrew in fear, or else one of Hokage Sama's search parties came too close for comfort. The Hokage and the village council do not share your sentiment, Hinako, said the first with baleful lies. They would know such evidence to be falsified, planted. They will not be satisfied unless they can confirm B. Either that, or they will search a year before they will give up. Hinako looked livid, but kept her mouth shut. The first swept his gaze around the council chamber. Are there any more suggestions that have not yet been offered? If not, then this meeting is. I have a suggestion, First Elder Takashi-sama. All heads in the room turned to the door which had, just moments ago, been closed, locked, and guarded. The tall figure that stood in the doorway was immediately recognized, and many of the advisors cringed. Captain Hiroto, greeted the first elder, I was not aware that the guards had been ordered to let you pass. It seems that I must reprimand someone later. Do not bother, growled Hiroto. They were not ordered to admit me. I won my way through by force, and with little difficulty, I might add. You may wish to consider using more accomplished Hugo for door security. Captain, you have just won your way through, the best that we had. Not surprising, for what are ordinary Hugo to the might of one such as yourself. You may dispense with the flattery, Takashi-sama. I am not interested. What are you imps sneering at? Hiroto said acidly, turning eyes of scathing molten silver upon a group of younger advisors in the back of the room. Please, Hiroto, pleaded the first with undaunted politeness, you say that you come to offer your suggestion, which is welcome. You need not pay any heed to my junior council members. They will be dealt with properly, I assure you. Sit down, please, and share your opinion with us. Thank you, but I will stand, said Hiroto, waving off the chair that the first indicated. He leveled a blazing glare at the offenders in the back. Very well, said the first, maintaining order. Your suggestion then, Captain Hiroto. 
Hiroto glared sidelong at the objects of his malice a little longer, but said what he had come to say. My suggestion, he said, voice filled with ice, is that you allow me to plant this evidence that you so desperately need. Hataki Kakashi searched the ruins of Orokimaru's laboratory thoroughly, but he does not possess our eyes. He found only one of the factory chambers, the one where the clones were given life. My men uncovered the second chamber, where Orokimaru's scientists used the genetically modified Kedui bloodline limit jutsu to transform them into the perfect likeness of the devil child. Hiroto grinned with satisfaction at the advisor's grim expressions. This technology is now in our hands. You lie came the protest from one of the frightened junior counselors in back. You are loyal to Hyashi. You are undoubtedly part of a grand scheme to wrest the political power back into his hands. Deathly silence reigned in the chamber. The older advisors shared dark, knowing glances, they knew the mistake that the whelp had just made. Hiroto's face did not discolor, his fists did not tremble, and his mouth did not retort with angry shouts. But no matter how calm he appeared to be, all could see the change that had come over the captain's eyes. They focused upon the younger counselor as the eyes of the all-consuming, monstrous dragon, pools of silver white em pulling their victim into drown. The victim was brave enough, or perhaps terrified enough, to remain where he was as Hiroto crossed the room towards him. Good for him, if he'd moved one inch, the angry captain's jab would have ruptured his heart. As it was, the thrust impaled the section of wall behind the space that was under the man's left armpit. The young man twitched, and looked up into Hiroto's eyes, which caught hold of him and held him like a mouse pinned underneath a cat's paw. I respectfully remind you, sir, said Hiroto coolly, that while you and your fellows hold sway the minds of our peaceful citizens, the military might of the Hyuga clan is still firmly ruled by Hyashi-sama. The only reason that your plotting and subversion is allowed to continue is because Hyashi-sama, who was once a strong and worthy leader, has become enmeshed in concern for his family, and grown soft, he no longer believes it is acceptable to use force against our own clansmen. All of the advisors, including the first elder, grimaced. They knew that everything he said was completely true, despite all that they wished to claim. The poor young advisor was much more shaken by what came next. I have no such qualms. Step out of line just once, and you may find it difficult to sleep at night. Hyashi-sama is commander-in-chief, but the fighters will obey my order just as readily as his. Oh, you counselors may have some converts, Hiroto cast a smug look at the two guards collapsed outside the door, but as you can see, they are too few and not the most reliable. You have been warned. Hiroto withdrew his hand from the hole in the wall, and walked back towards the door, much to the young man's relief. The first reasserted control. Captain Hiroto, though the whelp was undoubtedly speaking out of turn and rather rudely, he did present a valid point. As you say, the military Hyuga are firmly under Hyashi-sama's heel, including yourself. How may we be certain that you intend to help us? Hiroto smiled, an ill omen. If I had wanted to destroy your cause, I could have done so a long, long time ago. Yet, I have reason not to, though those reasons are not for you to know. You may take up my offer or not. It makes little difference, for my aims will be accomplished regardless. The room was again quiet as the first elder considered. In all his years of service on the council, more than anyone else, for which he was called the first elder, he had never been presented with such a radical, shadowy, and absurd idea. Yet, if Hiroto could deliver what he promised, the false great father's advantage would be negated far sooner than they could have hoped for. He could see the eyes of the other counselors, could see the fear and distrust of Hiroto and the desire to have nothing to do with this scheme of his. But Takashi was an old man, nearing the end of his life, the stress of enduring the constant protests, forever and ever until the end of his numbered days, was not something that he wanted to leave the world with. The other advisors wanted to act. He would lead the world as the one who led them in action. How soon can you be ready to lead Hokage Sama's search teams to your cloned sound ninja, Hiroto? asked the first. No Hugo had ever been more horrified and fearful of a smile. I began preparations eight days ago. We will be ready tonight. Ooh. Keisuke knew that Naruto had undergone changes the moment the blonde boy walked into the ramen store. The change was not noticeable to the eye, but Keisuke was not one to rely on eyesight. The change was felt in Naruto's aura. Though it remained decidedly jubilant and strong and healthy, and Naruto greeted Ayami's, the true Ayami, 
cheerful welcome with cheer of his own, Keisuke was not blind to the shifting and squirming of Naruto's inner substance. They sat together for the first time in many days. Naruto was here without Hanata this time, the reason being that Neji had called off for his sleeping break and had offered to keep watch while Naruto ate and contact him through Keisuke's repaired radio if she went anywhere outside her house. Keisuke just happened to be searching the environs of Ichiraku Ramen at that moment, and happily agreed to run communications between the two. He knew it wasn't authorized, of course, but it was easier to seek forgiveness than permission, in his book. They engaged in pleasant and mostly meaningless conversation, catching up on what they'd been doing, laughing or commenting on humorous stories, comparing favorite ramen flavors, Naruto did most of the talking on this subject, and would have gone on endlessly had Keisuke not changed the focus at the first opportunity to the black clouds over the village, and anything that had nothing to do with what they were really thinking about. Although pointless, it did much to lift Keisuke's spirits. Despite all odds against him, his crusade against the Hyuga system was slowly marching towards victory. Naruto himself seemed to be having fun. Satisfied, Keisuke was about to tell Naruto that he'd enjoyed talking and had best be on his way, but a sudden question from his blonde companion stopped him. Keisuke ni chan, you've been in love before, right? This question was so unbelievably random that he nearly fell over on his stool. Bewildered, he replied, I suppose that's true, yeah. What makes you ask? No big reason, really. But, ah, uh, in his aura, Naruto's subtle turmoil crested. Ah, uh, Keisuke thought, suddenly understanding. So that's what it was. You've never really been in love before, finished the blind man, and you wanted to know what it's like. Right. Naruto averted his face, trying to cover up the embarrassment he felt at asking this question. Keisuke nodded in recognition of the gesture. I thought so. It's not something us men are extraordinarily good at talking about, he said. Have another bowl. It'll help you. Hey hey hey. Naruto, his stability somewhat restored by this offer, motioned to old Mantuki, but the ramen cook was already there with the sixth helping. What's that? I suddenly can't hear anything at all. I army, please fetch the hydrogen peroxide. I'm going to need my ears cleaned. Tuki clapped his hands to his ears as he spoke and both he and Ayami walked out of the lobby. He winked at them before he disappeared. Ichiraku-san is kind to offer us this privacy, Keisuke observed. Yeah, said Naruto, slurping up some of his noodles. The blind man leaned forward onto the counter, pulling off his sunglasses and running a hand through his unkempt brown hair. Now, he said, I presume you were talking about the kind of love one has for his or her spouse. Naruto gulped down his mouthful and stared into his bowl. Yeah, that's the one. Keisuke folded his arms over the countertop and said, I'm not exactly sure how it is for a woman to a man. Nor can I really say that the customs of courtship and marriage are exactly the same as they were when I was married, seeing as that was likely several centuries ago. I can't tell you anything about the outward manifestation of this thing we call, love. What I can tell you is that when it happens, for a man, the first thing you want to do is grab on and never let go, he said, recalling fond memories of his past life. In that stage, it's all about the stuff that teenagers can do when their parents aren't around, but you can get that much from a simple crush, you start to see the differences when the pair runs into problems. The parents find out, one of them has to move farther away, etc. The first signs of real love is the ability to make the commitment to get around those barriers and all barriers to come. Naruto took this in, nodded, and waited for him to continue. Second stage, you find a barrier that you never thought you would have to overcome, the other person. Everybody keeps secrets, kid. When people live together long enough, those secrets start to come out, and not all couples survive some of those secrets. The second signs of real love are seen when the two of them can forgive each other for what hides beneath and love each other regardless. This is usually the most emotional part. Making sure to note this important information down in his brain carefully, Naruto slurped up more ramen. Keisuke had been right. It was easier to talk about when there was pork and miso in front of him. Yeah, and, he said, looking at him expectantly, what's the third sign? Keisuke picked his arms up off of the counter and folded them over his chest. Well, let's see, he said, once you're committed, and once you're out of things to hide, you should have developed a number of things between you. One of them is mutual trust, he counted on his fingers, another is a mutual understanding, 
Both of you know where the other is going in life, why you're taking the other with you, and what purpose your togetherness serves on that journey. It's important that you keep up to date on the understanding, and constantly reaffirm it, or you forget and the relationship will corrode over time. If you can go through all of that, and you still haven't K each other, you're in love, kid, Keisuke said. Be sure you don't call it love ahead of time, before you've gone through it, then you'll be in a place you really, really don't want to go. Trust me, I almost went there once, myself. He chuckled over that particular memory, and put his sunglasses back on. So, Naruto said, finishing his ramen, what you need to check for is commitment, secrets, trust, and understanding, right? Yep, Keisuke said, standing up. That's about it. What's the hardest part? Naruto asked. A memory of a voice shot through the blind man's head. Getting her to shut up when she's being a nuisance, he said. Ha, huh. ah, uh, uh, never mind. Different for every person. You'll figure it out, Keisuke amended. That wasn't Yuka's voice, he thought. Yuka never chided me like that, not once. Then he groaned mentally. Suddenly, he had the image of a set of small pale hands to go along with the voice, and a familiar silk shirt and tough black pants, with studded leather braces on the forearms that just screamed, Rebel. No face came to mind, for he had seen through the person who possessed those hands and those clothes. The eyes of the person he saw through could not turn back to see that person's face. But he knew well who they belonged to. S, he thought, I really need to keep a handle on my imagination, or who knows what it will show me when I'm riled up by my final victory. Oi, Keisuke, the call from the door of the Ichiraku ramen restaurant was Shikamaru's. What are you doing sitting around here? Just helping my little brother do his duty, Nara-san. Keisuke meant both the duty of protecting Hanata and the secret duty that Keisuke meant him to carry out. Granted, it would be a long time before Naruto had any influence on the Hugo beyond the girl, but it was never too soon to give his full support. Shikamaru flashed an annoyed glance at Naruto, but did not comment. If you're finished, he said, I need to speak to you and Neji as soon as possible. Got it, said the blind man, I was just leaving. Give me a second to pay up. Shikamaru nodded, grunted, and left. Keisuke left a stack of bills on the counter, and then went for the door himself. See you later, Keisuke Nichan. Naruto waved. You really helped me out. Thanks. Keisuke turned and faced him just as he was stepping out. No problem, Naruto. Suddenly, it seemed to Naruto that Keisuke was having indigestion. His face had screwed up, and his hand had gone to his chest. He leaned against the door as if it were a lifeline. Keisuke Nichan. Naruto questioned, what's wrong? Controlling himself, Keisuke turned to walk out the door. Before he shut it, he called over his shoulder. One last thing, Naruto, before I forget, he said. When you've gone through all the steps, and you're sure as hell that you're in love. Make damn sure that you don't outlive her. The door closed. Ooh. Leaping through the night, Haruka carried her new trophies towards Keisuke's house. This time, she would be certain that the blind bastard synchronized and saw them. Let him try to escape, she'd waited long enough, and she would have his acknowledgement without fail. Her braided hair, black as the void, whipped in the wind, a show of defiance in the little tranquil moonlight that pierced the clouds. Over 50 photographs had been accolated. Every one was a small miracle, for skill was required to snap the camera without being seen, especially when one had to be on the lookout for enemy Hugo that prowled the streets. Each one was a treasure, for never before had such artful depiction of two happy teenagers taken place. The happiness itself was a miracle, made possible by Haruka's genius. Nobody in the world could deny her prowess now, especially not an eyeless, weak-minded, closed-thinking former human icicle. She was just about to make the final leap onto Keisuke's roof when she nearly tripped right over Uzumaki Naruto, who was lying prostrate on the rooftop below. Exercising superior reflexes, Haruka landed cat-like on the roof beside him, crouched down to see his face. Naru. S-S-S-H-H-H. Quiet, Haruka Nechan. They might hear you. Naruto's voice was hushed and carried a sense of urgency. Joining him in prostration on the rooftop, Haruka lowered her own voice. Who are we eavesdropping on? She asked. More importantly, don't you have a Hugo heiress to protect? Naruto's grimace was barely visible in the pale moonlight. Yeah, he replied, but I think this may be big. 
huge. Maybe could make the bodyguard job completely unnecessary. While the end of the bodyguard job meant the end of most of her fun, Haruka knew the importance of what he was getting at. Orokimaru and Uchiha Sasuke were a huge thorn in the side of Kanoa, and a thorn in the side of Keisuke's Hyuga Redemption Alliance. To eliminate that threat meant eliminating obstacles all around, in the long run. She kept quiet. After a moment, she heard the voices below for herself. You're sure this is it, Shikamaru? The stronghold we've been looking for. Haruka recognized the voice as Keisuke's. No, came the reply, I'm sure there's something of the sound ninjas down there. The noises I heard, but I don't know what it is. That's why I've come to get you. It's not safe to go poking around in there alone. Judging the nature of the sounds and the ease of access to the trap door, can you roughly guess how many people are down there? This voice was Neji's. At least 10, said Shikamaru after a moment of thought, but it could be as many as 30. It only takes one to assassinate a person, said Keisuke thoughtfully. But we don't know if their intent is a silent assassination or theft. It could be a large-scale raid, in which case there would be more of these hiding places. Neji. Maybe there are tunnels underneath that lead to other holes. This one is hidden smack in the middle of a massive sewage system and water supply grid, after all. Keisuke. It doesn't matter. Our orders are to learn as much as we can without engaging in combat. Shikamaru. We'll be going through tight spaces. Neji. Keisuke, since both of you can find your way around and detect trouble in the dark, one of you will be on either side of me at all times. Neji will be in front, since he is the best at close quarters combat. I will be in the middle, where I can use my long-range techniques at a safe distance and communicate orders to both of you efficiently. A pause, where presumably the other two nodded. All right, Shikamaru continued. Remember, we are not to engage the enemy under any circumstances other than immediate self-defense, in which case they must be dealt with swiftly and quietly. Bye, deal with, I do mean K, we don't want to knock anyone out just to have them wake up and sound the alarm when we're deep in enemy territory. Are you okay with that, Keisuke? The blind man might have replied harshly, but he remembered that he was the new shinobi in town. Shikamaru had to know that he could be trusted to do what had to be done. He replied respectfully. I have no problems with taking lives that would take other lives. That's good enough, I suppose, said Shikamaru, although his tone indicated that a simple, yes, on Keisuke's part would have been fine. One more thing, if you encounter either Orokimaru or Uchiha Sasuke, flee immediately. Do not attempt to fight either one, and don't play the hero so that others can escape. Orokimaru has a reputation for what he does with heroes. Another pause, more nodding probably. Then, okay, follow me. The entrance that I found is in the pipe system below the Hockage Tower. Atop their roof, Haruka and Naruto stood up. Damn it, said Naruto. Someone's finally going to do something major about the sound, and I'm stuck on guard duty. Haruka's hand went to his shoulder. We're going after them. What? But, like you said, Naruto, the success of this mission means the success of your other mission. Besides, she said, her face getting the first inklings of the battle carving, sadist's glow, upon him, that blind idiot won't go long without tripping over something and waking up the whole hive. Against all those sound, he's definitely not going to survive without me. I'm doing him a favor. Yeah, that's it. He'll owe me for this for sure. Naruto gave his own foxy smile, the one that made everyone want to put all their faith in him. All right. On the wide tree branch where she rested, Sakura could easily see the entrance to the Hyuga complex even in the heavy dark of the clouded night. It was only two rooftops away, and she could leap across these and be there in moments should her charge decide to take a nighttime stroll. Granted, most Hyuga tended to remain in their beds at night, for which Sakura was grateful, but this did not mean that she could relax her vigilance. She had to be ready to respond at an instant's notice. She and Naruto, since the beginning of their assignment, had been camping in this tree during the nights, taking turns watching the gate. The theory was that while one of them slept, the other could be on the lookout and wake them if one of their charges emerged and have them take over. There was, however, one flaw in the plan, it didn't work when there was no second person to watch for you while you slept. Sakura had been looking forward to the end of her watch, but now Neji had left and Naruto had not returned, not only was Hanata minus one bodyguard, but if the blonde didn't hurry up, 
then he might not be suitable for any job for a long, long time. The pink wanted badly to toss vigilance to the winds and go after him, but discipline, her curse be on it, kept that impulse in check. Therefore she waited, eyes drooping, fists clenched, and mind seething, for some sign of her doomed teammate's return. Her patience paid off. Just as she had been on the verge of toppling the tree in frustration, she found herself facing not just one, but twelve orange-clad shinobi, all of them with happy grins on their faces. This appearance sent Sakura mixed signals. Naruto wouldn't create his cage bunchons for no reason, so either something strange was afoot or he had a plot in mind. The great smiles all around implied that something good had happened, or that Naruto was about to make something good happen. Knowing that she was going to be losing yet more sleep, Sakura repressed her tired sigh. What are you so happy about, Naruto? Sakura, said the Naruto nearest to her, they've found it. Suddenly the pink-haired girl was wide awake. Found. What? He knelt on the tree limb grasped her shoulders, and smiled wider. They've really found it this time. Keisuke and his group are going into the sound's hiding place. Sakura's mouth went agape with disbelief. What? Already? But they've only been looking two weeks, and there are so many hidden places. Shikamaru thinks that this one is the main one, the Naruto said. If he's right, and they find what they've been looking for, then the next step is full-scale attack. We'll root those bastards out for good, and then... Sakura had stopped listening. She could figure out for herself where his train of thought was going. Find the sound, infiltrate their base, root him out, find Sasuke, beat him up, if necessary, and drag him someplace where he can be made to see the error of his ways. You're going in with them, aren't you? She asked. All of the Naruto's nodded at her. I'm leaving my bunchons here to watch for Hanata until I get back. They can do your job, too, if that's what you want. Sakura had expected as much. Does Kakashi-sensei know? No, Naruto admitted. This is only the scouting stage, to make sure that this is the real deal. I was going to have him come with the actual raiding party, save him for when he's really needed. You, though, I think you'd want to come along every step of the way, like I did. This was more kindness and consideration than Sakura remembered seeing from the boy. Three years ago, he would have wanted to charge in without delay, taking no time to think about anything else. It was good to see that he was keeping all of his bases covered. However, a strange feeling had stolen over her. She really did not think that Shikamaru's team would have been able to find their quarry so soon. Orokimaru, aside from being extremely crafty, had known this village's secrets inside and out in his day, so hiding 100 or so shinobi should not have been difficult. Then there was the fact that it was not at all advisable to hide all of that force in the same region, lest that one region be discovered and compromise the whole mission at once. No, Sakura did not like the feeling she got from this news. It smacked of treachery. That's very considerate of you, Naruto, she said. But I'm not so sure this is the real thing. There's no way that even Shikamaru and Neji should have found it so quickly. It might be some kind of trap, set by Orokimaru to mislead us. If it is, I don't want to spring it. That's always been your job. The Naruto in front of her chuckled, remembering those glorious days from long ago when he'd blundered into every make and model of trap set in his path. It hadn't been funny at the time, of course, but the years tended to add humor to even the most life-threatening of experiences. Yeah, he said, I guess it always has. You probably want to sleep, too, since I was out for so long. Sorry about that. His hand found the back of his head and began to scratch, and his smile turned apologetic. That's fine, Naruto, said Sakura. Thanks for thinking about me. Go spring that trap and let me know if I'm wrong, okay? Yup, said the blonde in front of her. See ya. His work finished, the bunch and puffed away into smoke, the memory of the conversation flying back to the jutsu's caster. The rest of the bunchons took up positions in the tree, watching the gate in place of the weary Sakura. Be careful, Naruto, she whispered to no one. Ooh. Well, questioned Haruka. What's the word? They're about to head down, you know. Her white eyes were fixated on the trio below them, who were pulling up a sewer grate. Her voice was tense with anticipation. The memory of the dissipated clone reached the true Naruto, bringing a slightly sad expression to his face. She's not coming. A pity, Haruka said, too absorbed in her pursuit to care much. 
but it's a stealth advantage to us to have less people, so there's no real loss. Speaking of stealth, Naruto said, his sad look replaced with a serious one, how are we going to follow them without being seen? Neji has the Byakugan like you do, if you can see them, they can see us. Neji will be in the front, looking more forward than back, Haruka said. The only one I need to see is Keisuke, in the back. I follow him, I follow them all. If I can see Shikamaru, I'll know I'm getting too close to Neji, and I can back off a little, but even if I slip up and get Neji in sight range, then I'll have plenty of time to back off before he sees us, because his attention is in front of him. Naruto frowned. I don't know, Nei-chan, he said. What if Neji's Byakugan is stronger than yours? Neji is not more perceptive than me. These words were almost a snarl, and Naruto felt compelled not to press the issue. Eh hey hey, if you say so. Almost as scary as Sunida Bar Chan. They're through the grate, Haruka said. Time to go. Ooh. As it turned out, Haruka's statement was the truth. Neji was completely unaware of them. His attention was fixed in front of him and to his sides, trusting Keisuke to watch their six o'clock. They entered the sewers, sought out the hidden trap door that Shikamaru had found, and climbed through it into one of the darkest passageways that Neji had ever known. Even his own Byakugan could only see the outlines of the walls and the openings in them. For the first time, Neji was envious of one without a Byakugan, Keisuke was completely at home in this environment. He did not have the luxury of thinking on it long, though. Years of discipline brought his thoughts back to the task at hand, the dangers that the team could face. If this was truly the central hub of the Sound Ninja's hiding place or was close to it, then they ran a high risk of encountering large numbers of enemies. Not only that, they might be made to face one of the most dangerous enemies the village had ever known, against which they would have little chance. The knowledge was very sobering. And then, of course, one had to consider the possibility of finding Uchiha Sasuke. Neji had never known the young Uchiha well, and had little affinity for him even though S had it that their two clans were related. What he knew, he knew mostly through Sakura, and even she had spoken little of it in the past three years. Neji had few reasons to like him and many reasons to dislike him. But he had all the reason in the world to respect him, Uchiha Sasuke possessed one of the most powerful, and the most feared, Kekai Genkai techniques known to Kanoa, and had been trained by one of the world's most ruthless K. Surely, his power had to be immense. Just how immense had yet to be seen, but Neji had no doubts in his mind that the Uchiha genius would be a handful if they ran into him. He remained engrossed in these thoughts until the sudden rise in the effectiveness of his vision brought him up short in the passage. What's the matter, Neji? asked Shikamaru. His whispered words echoed off of the stone walls, causing the whole party to grimace. Yet, when no hordes of sound shinobi appeared to smite him down, Neji deemed it safe to reply. There will be a lit chamber ahead. There is a possibility that we are becoming closer to what we seek. Shikamaru's nod was lost in the darkness. Keisuke, are you picking up anything? Not yet, sir, said the blind man. Light travels much faster than sound or vibration, and is easier to detect from great distance. Admittedly, my ears are better conditioned than most humans, but if there's anything over there I'll need to be closer to hear it. How do you want to proceed, Shikamaru? Asked Neji. A pause, then, keep to the right wall. Light footfalls, hand signal communication only once we reach better light. Uh, is there any way we can communicate silently with you, Keisuke? I can feel the motions of your hands. Tap me on the shoulder to get my attention, then signal away. Shikamaru hadn't been around the blind man long enough to know how this was possible, but didn't want to question it. This was no time to dally, anyway. All right, let's go. As they neared the light that Neji spoke of, Shikamaru's vision began to improve as well. Soon, he could make out his comrades against the blackness. Keisuke tapped him in the back. Shikamaru and Neji turned to look. I hear voices, he signed. How many? asked Shikamaru. Closer, signed the blind man. They kept going further, and soon Neji and Shikamaru were able to hear a jumble of conversation. Calling a halt and turning to Keisuke again, Shikamaru repeated his question. Many many voices, came the reply. See anything? Not yet. Light growing, Neji assured him. Indeed, the passageway did brighten. Though it branched off in numerous places in maze-like fashion, 
Neji could always tell which way the light was coming from, and they did not lose themselves. Shikamaru made careful note of the way they had come, tucking it away for when the time came to return to the surface. At last, they came to a bend in the passageway around which the light glowed very brightly. Neji nodded to Shikamaru, this was as close to the source as they would get without coming upon it. Keisuke took note of the nod. Found it. Yes, signed Neji. I count 30 voices, signed Keisuke. These were as many as he had been able to distinguish, though his ears might have missed some in the confusion. Not to mention, there may have been more that had not spoken at all. By now, both Neji and Shikamaru could hear the low jumble of hushed conversation readily, and they agreed with grim looks that Keisuke's estimate sounded pretty accurate. You look. Stay in shadow, signed Shikamaru to Neji. The order was obeyed without hesitation, though the young Hyuga was loath to believe that there could be so many hidden beneath the streets so near the Hyuga compound. He crossed to the left wall and, hugging it to stay as well hidden as he could, Neji peered out into the lit room. He was astonished by what he beheld. Before him was a suspended stone walkway that spanned the length of the room to a doorway on the other end. On either side of the walkway, all down its length, was a sunken stone pit. Wooden ladders hung from the walkway at intervals, allowing access from it down into the pits. Above the walkway, embedded in the ceiling, was a brightly burning light fixture. The apparatus cast blaring yellow light into the pits, which Neji could see had been made into comfortable living spaces, complete with pantries, small kitchens, doors that presumably led to toilets, and numerous chairs and couches. And within those chairs and couches, found them, Neji signed. His face was ashen. How many? asked Shikamaru. Many. Boo. Hyuga Shinosuke, aide to Captain Hiroto, observed the intruders approach from the safety of the control room. The use of the night vision cameras, even with the greatly magnified range, had to be timed meticulously, for if they were not withdrawn into their pockets in the walls almost immediately after seeing the targets, Hyuga Neji would walk into Byakugan range and see them. It was difficult work, but Shinosuke was attentive and managed to keep all of the cameras hidden from his clansmen's sight. The last camera, the one suspended from the ceiling in the pit chamber, had been hidden away only a moment ago, after confirming their arrival there. Hiroto Sama, he said into the radio, they have come, as you said they would. The blind one is with them. Hi, Hiroto Sama. He trails behind, guarding their backs, as Neji Senpai looks forward. And the other two that you spoke of, the ones that follow them in the shadows. They hide one corridor behind, just beyond the first group's sight. A pause on the other end, and then the order came through. Proceed as we planned, said Hiroto. Full facility lockdown, and trap the false great father separate from the other two. We will let the two followers alone, they can do little harm or good once the lockdown is in place. Hi, Hiroto Sama. The radio clicked off. Shinosuke was loath to orchestrate this mission. So many human beings had been brought to life through their hands in the last few days. Now, each and every one of them would d, and in the process fool the whole village into thinking that they had vanquished a great enemy. The council may have believed that there was no threat from Orokimaru, but Shinosuke believed that it was foolish to assume so, for all they knew, the sound might be hiding in much greater numbers than even the Hyuga had thought to portray. If they were wrong, Kanoa might be wiped off the face of the world. And for what? Just so the council could rest more easily about a blind man and teenage hormones. Shinosuke did not like this at all, and if he had had any say, he would not be here. Yet, orders were orders, and under Hiroto, defiance of orders was as good as a death sentence. Therefore, Shinosuke did not question them. He reactivated one of the hidden cameras to sneak a quick glance at the forward group's back. Thankfully, Neji was still focused forward, and the camera was out of reach of Keisuke's feelers. Seeing that the blind man stood a comfortable distance away from his fellows, Shinosuke waited until Shikamaru came forward to confirm Neji's sighting, then put the plan into action. Sliding open an old hidden panel and yanking on an old handle, he initiated the fortress's antique defense mechanism. Then, Picking up the intercom that the Hyuga had installed for just this occasion, Shinosuke altered his voice, delivering the proclamation of a doom that would not come to pass. Boo. As soon as the shadow user laid eyes upon the fifty or so sound ninja that rested in the pits below, a loud clunking noise was heard. Too shocked by what he was looking at to react quickly, Shikamaru was caught off guard. 
Neji, however, was not. He noticed the heavy panels in the walls falling into the floor, saw the death that waited behind. Keisuke groped around with his feelers, trying to figure out where the wall had gone, but he did not perceive the punji trap as quickly as Neji's Byakugan could. Diving back into the passage, Neji shoved the blind man out of harm's way just as the sharp rod's s closed. Though Neji and Keisuke were separated from Shikamaru, they were unharmed. A voice emanated from the walls. It was deep and resonant, and it carried the weight of a dirge, if not the melody. Welcome, Kanoa Shinobi, it said. It is very pleasant to have you here, after waiting so long. We were beginning to grow bored waiting for our master's order. Shikamaru had recovered his wits, and was now testing the bars that blocked the passage behind him. He could see Keisuke and Neji on the other side, but he could not budge the trap. That won't work, I'm afraid, came the voice again. We are in the ruins of the old daimyo's castle, in the dungeon level. Did you know that the daimyo of the fire country once resided here? It was some time before Kanoa was built, perhaps the great father remembers. Ah, but I digress. This ancient prison below the castle was equipped with a very durable emergency lock, which now blocks your way. The prison pits below you, which now serve us as our home away from home, as well as the first sections of corridor leading out from them, could be sealed off by these multi-layer locks in case the guards were ever overpowered by their prisoners. As you can see, it is quite strong, for it was designed to hold even shinobi prisoners. Below Shikamaru, hooting calls and dangerous leers rose up from the pits. Already, the first of them had begun to climb up the ladders on either side of the walkway. The shadow user, cursing himself for becoming separated from his team, backed against the trap's bars and prepared to fight him off alone. Ooh. Shinosuke put down the intercom and looked at his monitor again. He was unnerved to find that he had captured two of them in the corridor rather than just Keisuke. This was not good for the plan. Neji's taijutsu and Shikamaru's midrange support techniques would have held the narrow walkway much easier than Shikamaru alone. Though the clones sound nin had had advanced combat training implanted in their minds, they'd had no actual combat experience, and could not think as creatively as the genuine articles. They would be significantly weaker than the Junin intruders. However, they had a 50 to 1 advantage rather than the 25 to 1 that Shinosuke had sought to create. Shikamaru might be overwhelmed, his team defeated, which was not according to plan. Kanoa was supposed to win this encounter. To top it off, Keisuke would have help, which didn't fit Hiroto's designs at all. The plan called for Keisuke to be overwhelmed and captured, though for what purpose Shinosuke hadn't the slightest idea. Perhaps Hiroto had found out about his failure to stay hidden while spying on the blind man and had decided to simply study the Rokujuyon Reud in captivity. He couldn't do anything about it now, though, making sure Kanoa won was top priority. Thinking frantically, Shinosuke looked for a way in which he might aid the shadow user. Checking his monitors, he found one within a few moments, and let out the breath he'd been holding. He picked up the radio, changed the frequency to the one used by the clone sound ninjas. Send a single squadron to attack the two stragglers outside cell 4. Use the overhead tunnels. Ooh. Naruto tried in vain to dislodge the heavy trap bars. His big blind brother was trapped within the sealed passage, with only Neji to help him. Panels had opened in the ceiling above them, and sound guards were dropping in to subdue them, as the daimyo's guards had once trapped and ambushed prisoners in the past. Beyond that, Shikamaru was trapped alone in a cell with 50 enemy ninja. The blonde tried everything he could think of to break through the bars, with the exception of the Raisingan. He held back on that technique for fear of metal shards flying off and impaling Haruka, who stood watching, stony-faced, behind him. That's all you can do, Naruto, she said. I want to help out, too, but those bars are as solid as you'll ever see in this life. We'll have to find a way around. That will take too long. Naruto said. It'll be over by the time we break through. Maybe not. There might be hidden access panels here, that the guards would have used to go through when the defense mechanism was triggered. She activated her Byakugan and began looking for them. Naruto's ghostly arms flared out from his tenkatsus, began searching every nook and cranny of the stone walls. If there are any, I'll find them for sure. Hang on, Keisuke. What they sought, however, was not within the walls. A panel opened up in the ceiling. 
Naruto, above us, alerted Haruka. Naruto looked up in time to stop the descending enemy's kunai from spiking into his head. Yanking his assailant down, he threw his foot up hard to meet him. The downward momentum of the sound ninja, coupled with the hard upward thrust of the foot, was not healthy for the ninja, who fell to the floor gagging and did not get up. Haruka's eyes crackled with the intensity of battle. The next two that came from the opening above fell at once to her sweeping, relentless strikes, K one of them with a swift jukan strike to the heart, she flung his body in the path of his comrade, who tripped over it and was felled by Haruka's crushing elbow in his back, pinning him to the floor and fracturing his spine. The fourth sound Shinobi made the mistake of believing Naruto to be less dangerous than Haruka. He moved swiftly to K the latter, who had her back turned as she K his fellows, and was dispatched to the void by the Raisingan, courtesy of the former. When all four lay D or unconscious at their feet, Naruto and Haruka looked upward, upon the hatch from which the assailants had come. It had closed up after the last man had come through. It was now indistinguishable from the ceiling stone that surrounded it. There's our ticket inside, Haruka said. So how do we get it open again? Asked Naruto. At that moment, the clash of steel and the grunts of men striving to K one another came from the opposite side of the trap. Among them were the startled shouts of Keisuke and Neji. Apparently, the hidden guard's passage in the ceiling had openings into the sealed corridor, as well. Haruka looked at Naruto. I think we may just have to go with the standard Uzumaki Naruto style on this one. Quick and dirty, acknowledged the blonde. He started the chakra swirling in his right palm. Boo. There was only one hatch in the overhead tunnel that opened to the outside passageway. After all, who wants to provide more than one way for a prisoner who found the tunnel to escape? However, there were plenty of hatches that opened into the sealed corridor where the escapees were trapped. This allowed the guards to make ambushes from above much larger and more effective. It worked comparably well for the cloned sound ninja. Neji and Keisuke soon found themselves surrounded, not by the puny four that had found Naruto and Haruka, but a good 32. All of them had dropped out of immediate range of Neji and Keisuke's counterattacks, and thus they had had time to get organized. Unlike Shikamaru, these two did not have the advantage of only needing to defend a narrow walkway, their opponents had a wide passage in which to maneuver and many angles from which to strike. We are disadvantaged, said Neji. Tell me something I don't know, mumbled Keisuke. Can you detect any escape route, Keisuke-san? No. Can you make an escape route? Not without causing us both severe injury, I'm sorry to say. Then we must fight. Yep. Neji stood poised in his Jukan stance, on guard against the menacing horde. The enemies growled and jeered and drew flashy, jagged blades and heavy clubs. They advanced slowly, step by step, savoring their superior position and reveling in the upcoming K. The Hugo prodigy frowned at the sight. Barbarians, he thought aloud. You may have to use your Sanjuni Reud, Keisuke san. It will cripple you in the end, but we will be alive. Keisuke grinned. There's no need to cripple myself over this, Neji. A mob like this is dealt with much more easily with two than one. Especially, he said, snaking his ghostly arms toward Neji, when one is Hugo and one possesses the Reud. With his nearly 360 degree vision, Neji watched the thin tendrils press into his arms, legs, head, and back. They seemed balked at something, struggling to work past his skin. Relax your tenkatsus, Keisuke ordered. Allow them passage. It seemed odd to Neji that he would ask something like this, and he wondered what the blind man had in mind. Yet, as soon as he complied, Neji forgot that oddity. After the initial tingle of the road sinking through his flesh, the young Hugo Junin was introduced to an entirely new and wider world. What? He gasped, dazzled at the new sensory input he was receiving. Synchronization, Keisuke explained. Our senses and our chakra are pulled together. Don't be so enthralled with it that you forget our enemies, there, Neji. Indeed, Neji had almost lost himself in the sudden strangeness of having two sets of ears, two noses, two skins, and a set of long feelers. Keisuke's warning snapped him back to the present, where the mob of enemies regarded them strangely, wondering what the hell the Hugo boy was doing just standing there spacing out. Neji flowed back into his stance, his face returning to its serious state. He still marveled at the new sensations, but he had adjusted to it now. He would be able to fight, and undoubtedly with very heightened efficiency. Hi, Keisuke-san. 
Let us defeat them quickly, he said. My thoughts precisely, returned Keisuke. Now that I have your eyes, this will be much easier. Sixteen ghostly arms wrapped themselves into Keisuke's skin, forming the cryptic sign of conflagration. Fire sprouted immediately, filling the dimly lit corridor with flickering firelight. Come, said Keisuke, his voice low and promising doom. A few enemies were balked, but several brave shinobi charged forward. They met their end in searing pain as the Reu trap seal exploded in their faces, the flame dazzling those who had stayed behind. Twenty-six enemies remained alive. From behind the flames sprang six Keisukes, lunging into the fray like fiery hell spawn, swinging burning arms and legs into their foes. Enraged, the enemies concentrated all of their might upon these six demons, forgetting entirely the other player in the game. With the sound ninjas distracted by Keisuke and his bunchons, Neji darted across the board, taking pieces silently and unimpeded. The enemies never saw the Hugo Death Dealer until their last moment, as Neji drove his Jukan, powered with both his own blue chakra and Keisuke's sickly blue-yellow, into their unsuspecting innards. Despite Hiroto's well-laid plans, the false great father would not be captured just yet. Ooh. Observing from the hatches above, Haruka fumed. She saw the melee below, saw the enemy shinobi drawn to the Keisuke's like moths to flames, saw them fall victim to the S, stinging death that was Neji. It was a grand and magnificent show, as well as brutal and D. Haruka had seen it done many, many times before. Yet she had always, always viewed it from the perspective of the silent, stinging death, taking part in the symphony of glory rather than being a spectator. The fact that she was not a part of it now, that her part was being played by another, was a s in the face. It made her be boil, her fists tremble. So, she said through clenched teeth, it's the truth, then. I've been replaced. Haruka ne chan. Naruto's urgent plea came back through the tunnel, we gotta get moving. Keisuke ni chan and Neji can handle themselves down there. Shikamaru needs us now. Haruka knew this, but she was reluctant to move. She stayed where she was, looking down upon the synchronized combatants below and seething. Come on, insisted Naruto. He reached back and gave her silk shirt a light tug forward. Complying at last, Haruka went after him. Keisuke would come later. Right now, the mission needed to be saved. The two of them dropped down at the last hatch, Naruto nearly falling onto Shikamaru. It was well that the, almost, was present in this statement, for if it had not, Shikamaru was tired enough to not get back up. The shadow user had been using everything that he had to fend off the enemy. Thus far, he'd succeeded in K-12 of the 50, but the enemies that merely fell off the walkway, and these were many, as the walkway was very narrow and a single good push could send them toppling, just dusted themselves off and came around for another try. Thus, when Naruto had picked himself up and Haruka had landed with somewhat less of her usual grace, Shikamaru was glad to, once again, be in the company of a Huga and a Reud user. Haruka took over the front at once, wielding her fresh power against the diminished hordes. Her, sadist's glow, to those who recognized it, seemed to be more palpable than ever today as she felled the sound before her. The enemies who came at her were sea down as wheat against a sickle. Didn't you have your own assignment, Naruto? panted the exhausted Shikamaru. It's being taken care of, don't worry, Naruto replied. My bunchons would let me know if something happened. More important, how the heck did you get into this mess? Shikamaru would have frowned in annoyance if he wasn't gasping for breath. Idiot, they obviously had some kind of surveillance system. How Neji didn't see it, I don't know, but that isn't important. No, it's not, Naruto agreed. What's important is getting the hell out of here before the real trouble shows up. I think the real trouble is already here, said Shikamaru, gesturing below. The doors that they had thought led to restrooms were belching forth more sound ninja. For every enemy that either Shikamaru or Haruka had felled, two more came forth to replace him. It looks like these cells are all interconnected. There could be as many as ten more, all with about fifty men inside. Orokimaru wasn't planning any quiet assassination or theft, this is a full-scale raiding party. And we're in the middle of it. Haruka yelled, toppling another foe with a chakra-enhanced leg sweep. Well, let's not just sit here and wait to be wiped out, Naruto said. Come on, we'll go back through the tunnels in the ceiling. We can't retreat that way, Shikamaru said. 
I expect they'll have that corridor behind us packed with guards by the time we get over there. Besides, we don't have any cover to protect us from ranged attacks while we climb up the hole. Well, what are we supposed to do, then? Shikamaru closed his eyes and thought. Screams of the dying filled the air as his mind clicked away. After a few moments that seemed an endless eternity, he spoke again. Naruto, take over for Haruka. I need her eyes, he said. Naruto nodded. You got it. His Tomashibi no Kyubi shimmered into blue life at his back. Haruka had also heard the order, and sent a final enemy to his grave before allowing Naruto to step in. Then she stood before Shikamaru, awaiting the next command. Use your Byakugan and look behind the walls, Shikamaru said. They wouldn't have this trap mechanism here without also having a way to reset it. The switch to open the trap gates is probably hidden nearby. I got it, Haruka said. She turned her eyes to the stone. A few moments were spent in Haruka's searching, Naruto's whirlwind defense, and the minor explosions that were heard from the sealed corridor behind them. Finally, Haruka's eyes widened. She had made a discovery. There is one, she said, but not in the walls. It's in the floor. Where? Shikamaru asked, eager to release the trap and be on his way home. Haruka gestured to the middle of the walkway. A trap door in the center. A wheel beneath. So we need to get over there and crank the wheel, Shikamaru said. Easier said than done. The tide of enemies was relentless, and Naruto was expending huge amounts of energy to hold it back. They would have to go past and hold position beyond the first set of ladders. Well, he said, rising back to his feet, there's no time to spare. Haruka, make a path for us. Naruto, hold them off of our back. I'll support from the middle. We'll crank those gates open, grab Keisuke and Neji, and make for the exit together. All right, let's go. Boo. Four of the six Keisukes have been blown into smoke. Twenty-three sound had fallen to the flaming might of Keisuke and Neji's strike and fade tactics. Thirteen enemies remained. Keisuke was running low on chakra and had to borrow from Neji to keep going. Dividing into six and then supporting his flame seal for a prolonged period had drained him, for he was not the chakra freak that his little brother was. Thankfully, it was almost over. The enemy had been reduced to a small enough number to either death blow that was the end of this strategy. Keisuke pushed his clone through to the end of the sealed passage. His true body withdrew, going to stand at the other end. He motioned for Neji to follow him. The thirteen enemies stood, panting and gasping and growling, in the middle, eyeing both ends of the tunnel. They spotted the Hugo Junin who had been the death of so many of their comrades, and glowered. What a bunch of pushovers, gloated the true Keisuke. Look, Neji, the brainless brutes standing over there between me and you like they can't tell who it is that's been doing all the K. Catching onto Keisuke's ploy, Neji smiled and said, indeed. Their stupidity alone must have K half of them before we even got here, Keisuke-san. I'll have to bathe for a week before the contagious idiocy washes off of my hands. That tore it. The enemy rushed as one for Neji, howling and gnashing. Keisuke stepped back, getting out of the way. Drawing on the combined pull of chakra, Neji poured power into his palm, releasing it in a single wave at the enemy. Hack Kusho. The raw chakra surged forth, bowling the enemies over and backward towards the lone Keisuke Bunshin who stood alone at the other end. The true Keisuke ran his hands through a series of seals, ending in the sign of flames. Bunshin Bakudan no Jutsu. Clone explosion technique. The shockwave rocked the whole passage, blowing chips of stone and steel in all directions. Neji was forced to use the hack show chitin to deflect the D barrage. Keisuke, who felt yet more of the combined chakra pull deplete, vowed never again to use that jutsu indoors. When the dust cleared, the metal bars that sealed the passageway off from the cell had been blown away. Keisuke smiled, and was about to congratulate Neji on a job well done, until he realized that the rumbling had not ceased. Boo! Fighting their way through the never-ending swarm of enemies proved to be challenging, painful, and exhausting, yet they managed to do it. Haruka stood before the open trapdoor in the center of the walkway, Naruto and Shikamaru balanced precariously behind her, guarding her back. The enemy had guessed at their strategy and begun coming up the second pair of ladders in front of her, but their progress was slow, and Haruka had plenty of time to crank the wheel. She knelt on the stone and heaved once, twice, and a third time before the rusted mechanism turned. Muscles bursting with the strain, 
Haruka grounded the rest of the way around and fought to come back to her feet. She still had to fight her way back across to Keisuke. As she rose, a huge explosion rocked the cell, and a strangled cry came from Naruto's throat that soon turned into a cheer of triumph. Looking over her shoulder, Haruka saw that the gate had burst open. That did it, she exclaimed. It's open. Not quite, replied Shikamaru, look at the one on the other side. Turning to face front and delivering a jukan to the first of the next wave of attackers, she looked to the far end of the walkway. She gasped as she saw that that gate was still in place. I don't think that the switch we just threw was the release for the trap. Yelled Shikamaru over the noise. Then what was it? Haruka thought. As they fought back toward the exploded gate and Keisuke and Neji emerged, the answer came trickling out in their wake. Water ran across the floor and into the pit behind the two, slowly at first, and then in a river, then a torrent. You just activated the daimyo's old Masi chamber, yelled Keisuke. When the prisons filled up, the prison guards purged them by drowning all of the prisoners. Oh, that's wonderful, said Haruka. First I'm replaced, and now I'm going to drown. Troublesome, Shikamaru remarked. How high does the water rise? Well past the top of the pits. We'd best be finding higher ground, and soon, said Keisuke. I don't think there is any we can go to, Keisuke Nichan. Both of the gates are giant waterfalls, yelled Naruto. By now, the sound clones had figured out what was happening and had abandoned the fight, run screaming down the tunnels searching for their own exit. We'll have to make higher ground, then, said Keisuke. Hitoshizu Shintu. Keisuke began hurling shuriken at the left wall. They struck the stone and detonated, Keisuke's blue-yellow chakra ripping a hole into it. Shikamaru and Neji caught on and tied explosive tags onto kunai, and flung those at the wall as well. Soon the hole had become a cavern. When it was too deep to be widened from the walkway, Neji leaped into it, followed by Shikamaru and then Keisuke. Neji and Shikamaru continued to dig with their kunai, while Keisuke, suffering from chakra depletion, sank down to rest at the hole's edge. The pits had nearly filled with water. Haruka leaped from the walkway, aiming for the man-made cavern. But the walkway had become slippery, and Haruka came up short. She would have fallen into the pits, but Keisuke reached over the side and grabbed hold of her arm. Easy does it, sadist, said Keisuke, flashing his triumphant grin. Let go, you damned blind fool. Haruka snarled. I can take care of myself. She struggled to break free of his grasp, and the contents of her pockets began to escape, falling towards the watery grave below. Keisuke wondered what had caused Haruka to act so vehemently. Come on, Haruka, he said, taking the joke out of his voice, let me help you up. No. She twisted, broke his hold, and began falling again. Keisuke thought she was suicidal until he felt her adhere to the wall with her chakra and begin climbing on her own. What the hell has gotten into you? He asked as she pulled herself into the cavern. Nothing. She snapped. What's gotten into you, besides your new partner? What? Hey, Keisuke, said Shikamaru. If you aren't terribly busy, do you think you can help us dig some more? This tunnel is not going to be comfortable at this size with so many people crowded in. Ha. Huh. Oh. Hi. Give me one moment. Keisuke looked back at Haruka, but she was determinedly looking anywhere but at him. The sadist's glow had mutated in her to something dark and ugly, and it made Keisuke want to leave her be. He sat against the wall of the cavern wondering what in the world had happened, until finally he became aware of the last member of the group, standing stock still on the wet walkway. Hey, Naruto. Keisuke called, come up here. We'll need your chakra and your raising gun to dig our way to a dry passage. Naruto looked up from the photograph that he'd been holding, one that had fallen from Haruka's pockets. He appeared dazed for a moment, but then he shook it off and nodded his head. Yeah, Nichan, I'm coming. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.